Welcome, Ernie. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Agatha, for having me. It's really a pleasure. It's a pleasure for us too. So I'm um, diving straight in. I'm just going to start with my first question. Mm -hmm. um, in view of some background, could you please briefly expand on your personal kind of journey that led you to working in this field of deforestation with a focus on the Amazon rainforest? Well, it, I think it starts with, with my name because uh, my mom, so it was, you know, had no say on that. She decided to, to give my first name after uh, the indigenous chief, Hao Ni, which is one of the main uh, uh, leaders and actually one of the main uh, uh, global fighters for against deforestation in the Amazon. Uh, he has been a voice of the indigenous populations in Brazil for decades. And he has been touring the world uh, with Stink in the 80s and 90s. And more recently also, he's, he's still uh, now at, at the height of his 90s. He's still a very active voice uh, on, those, on those matters. And however, I didn't at first in my professional career uh, have the environment uh, or spe specifically the Amazon as, as the main focus because I was actually uh, a computer scientist by training. I did my undergrad in Italy. In Milan, I lived there for five years, and and then it was actually in Italy that uh, environmental issues started to get into my professional life because I worked for uh, the city of Milan in issues related to air quality and traffic in urban traffic. So how to reduce urban traffic through different measures and how that impacts on air quality in, on, on the city, and and since I found that fascinating, you now through data helping policymakers and having an impact on the well-being of you know a larger population then I, I thought that would be great to apply similar ideas in relation to my own country, in relation to Brazil. And of course, uh, deforestation and the conservation of the Amazon are top on the agenda. So that's what, when I decided to uh, study it further and, and then moved on to do my master's and my PhD in the UK, uh, specifically on deforestation, on the role of technology in preventing deforestation in the Amazon, and then decided to come back to Brazil uh, as a professor and also as a policy advisor. So in a, in a nutshell, uh, uh, you know, I have this very colorful kind of uh, uh, trajectory that led me here very gladly. Thank you so much, Ernie. That was great. Um, so um, moving on to the next question. Um, I talked about this briefly with you before today's session, but there is often a narrative of corruption and mismanagement of funds around um, the government of Brazil's conservation plan for the Amazon. Um, given your experience in this field and given that um, Brazil is your home country, what is your view on uh, their environmental policy? Well, uh, that, uh, I think we need to separate uh, things in, on, in two different uh, uh, issues. One thing uh, is actually issue of, of corruption, and we have had problems with uh, uh, corrupt forest rangers, you know, blackmail farmers, or basically being paid off to uh, to basically forget to have, have seen something wrong. But luckily, this has been reduced substantially uh, in the 2000s, and, and I would say most of that is behind us right now. Um, also, we have accusations actually coming directly from, from the federal government, from the federal government, the current government, which sees NGOs as a source of, of critique. And in order to delegitimize the whole environmental movement in Brazil, uh, the, the, the Brazilian president, Bolsonaro, and some of his aides have been putting forward uh, uh, often, and I would say always, uh, 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 baseless accusations that NGOs are uh, are corrupt, and even he, he has accused NGOs from actually actively putting fire on the Amazon and then earn money with that, which of course are baseless. And it has been found to be baseless by the police eventually. But in the meantime, we have a lot of uh, 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 a growing public perception, especially amongst its voters against the environmental movement as a whole. Um, and then a, a, a third issue is around how the government actually implements its policies right now. Uh, that even though you, you have publicly some efforts, especially with the Brazilian armed forces and some actions which have some, you know, which are uh, um, have a visual impact because it involves helicopters, etc. cetera. Uh, in practice, it's having a very little effect because the Brazilian government has actually changed the rules, making it much harder to actually oblige the farmers to pay fines. So in theory, you, they basically, they have, they have made uh, our forest rangers and our environmental policies toothless, uh, and so and that's actually helps to explain why we have uh, uh, growing deforestation, especially in the Amazon, which has actually hiked by thirty percent uh, in relation to last year, which 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 makes us to be extremely worried about what's going on. 
Thank you so much. Um, kind of from hearing you speak, I can definitely understand that it's a very complex issue that involves a lot of different um, stakeholders. Um, but obviously, after all your work, um, you're starting to get to the bottom of all of this. Um, so on the topic of kind of the carbon cycle, um, many claim that the Amazon rainforest emits more CO2 than it absorbs today because of all of the soil erosion and deforestation in the past. Um, could you please tell us if you think this sign statement has some scientific basis and um, how the carbon cycle in the Amazon has changed over the years? Yeah, no, you, you are correct. Um, so for, for many years, uh, the large groups of researchers have been studying the carbon cycle in the Amazon. Uh, we have the LBA program with, uh, uh, with NASA and Brazilian scientists and European scientists. We have actually huge uh, scientific instruments built in the, in the forest, which are uh, you know, towers sometimes as high as, uh, as skyscrapers. Uh, and they are collecting 24 hours per day, 36, uh, five days uh, uh, per year, uh, data about how much carbon is actually being captured, how much is being emitted uh, uh, by the forest. So now, now we have a very uh, uh, um, detailed picture of what is going on. And, uh, and historically, uh, the Amazon has been absorbing more carbon than it has been emitting. Uh, of course, the Amazon breathes also through the stations. So the forest, um, when it's during the drier season, it tends to emit more. During the wet season, it captures back. Uh, but what I have seen, uh, especially after the last decade, is that due to mainly deforestation, but also due to climate change and fires, because all those aspects are, are interconnected, that the forest nowadays is, even the parts without direct impact from man, are emitting more carbon or are actually capturing much less carbon than they used to do before, depending on the area you are, you are dealing with. There are some areas that are emitting more, and but all areas are capturing less. And this is extremely worrisome, um, not only uh, because it, it, it means that we are uh, uh, interfering in, uh, in the global climate, uh, of course, still very much less than the burning of fossil fuels, but also it means that we might be losing an, an area of extremely rich uh, uh, ecosystems and with a, very, one of the highest biodiversity in the world. And, and it also gives some uh, further evidence to one of the uh, uh, theories that have been put forward in the last decades on the risk of savanization. Of the, of, the, of, the, of the rainforest. Uh, because when the climate becomes drier and there is less rain, uh, the, 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 the tree and animal species, uh, which are from drier areas, such as in the bordering Cerrado, which is the biome that borders the Amazon rainforest, they are basically going to expand uh, into, into the forest. And, and, and so basically the forest, which is already happening on the border, uh, is going to slowly uh, give space uh, to a much poorer, uh, um, a kind of environment with less species, both animal and, and plant species. So it's a loss in, in all fronts. Thank you so much, Roni. Um, quite a scary picture um, you've painted for us. So just um, as a follow-up to that, um, do you, I, I mean, I know a lot of these changes are irreversible and now it's, it's kind of too late to at least um, recover the land that's already been lost. But um, is there any way um, to, for example, um, regenerate or in some ways, um, land that's been eroded and that can no longer absorb carbon? Is there any way to recover that land and reuse it and repurpose it? Absolutely. I mean, Brazil has more than, than 60 million hectares of degraded pastures, uh, which are uh, actually uh, a very, provide very good opportunity for uh, forest restoration without an impact on reducing uh, food production. And, and forest restoration, it's a very, very important tool uh, however, it's not enough for Brazil to do that alone, because since um, we have both uh, uh, climate impact created by local deforestation and also global climate change, we, if we don't reduce uh, greenhouse emissions worldwide, and, 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 97, and, and actually 97% of all greenhouse gas emissions are done outside of Brazil, so from other countries, and most, um, um, most, uh, mostly in, uh, in the United States, China, and, and Europe. So if you don't do energy transition on those countries and mitigate climate change, the Amazon is going to surfer is going to surf a lot, uh, uh, even with uh, zero deforestation, even with forest restoration. So the world depends on the Amazon, and the Amazon depends on the world. Depends on tackling climate change worldwide. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Um, so, kind of on that topic um, of soil and of erosion. Um, Carbon uptake by soil has recently been publicized as kind of one of the most promising uh, discoveries, especially in places like the US, where regenerative agriculture um, 
does show a lot of promise in terms of um, carbon absorption. Um, could you please tell us whether you think maybe soil regeneration is a viable option, uh, specifically in the Amazon rainforest? And many even say that we should stop all of our efforts to kind of try to mitigate deforestation and put these into soil regeneration. Um, do you think this is too far as a view? Yeah, well, we have done uh, research on, on, on cattle desification and better uh, soil management and also in agriculture. And there is an important potential there uh, because at the end of the day, um, to, to take care of land, it's, it's a very important aspect of having a sustainable life on earth. And uh, which means basically, you know, not uh, avoid overusing uh, different agricultural inputs and, uh, and fertilizants and, uh, and, and, and pesticides. And, and when you do that, and there are species which are particularly good uh, in terms of replacing some of those inputs, um, you can, for instance, have uh, more uh, carbon absorbed in the soils. You also can avoid uh, reduce and even sometimes even replace completely uh, the injection of uh, nitrogen, which is a major environmental issue, especially in Europe and, and uh, in, the, in, the, in North America. But in Brazil, for instance, uh, we managed to develop technology with crops that, uh, that basically it, there is a microorganism uh, that works in the plants in order to fix nitrogen directly to the roots of the plant. So you don't need to, to get you know, nitrogen and put it on the soil and then that's going to have uh, uh, then to contaminate watersheds, etc. Uh, and all of that uh, leads to healthier soils and soils with more carbon. However, I think it's very dangerous to compare the potential of, of climate mitigation through soils in comparison to, to, uh, different, to reducing deforestation, even forest restoration, because we're talking about completely different uh, uh, scales. Uh, just to give an example, uh, right now, uh, uh, the emissions from deforestation in Brazil are more than 400 uh, million tons of CO2. Uh, when you start modeling the potential for restoring uh, and for capturing uh, uh, CO2 from uh, soils, uh, in some cases, it doesn't reach even 10 million uh, tons of, of CO2. So you have, you know, 400 million versus 10 million. So they are comp at a completely different scale. Uh, you know, just it, it's easier just to picture that, you know, how much carbon there is in a full form forest, which is, you know, 40 meters high, and how much carbon can possibly be captured on, on the roots of especially crops, which tends to have uh, shallow roots or roots that go down up to a, a couple of meters. Um, and, and so this gives an idea of what, what is the, you know, the, the carbon capturing potential for one uh, versus the other. Yeah, thank you so much. I think that definitely highlights um, how even, even though um, kind of a solution might be promising, it really depends on where exactly you are in the world. And I think definitely the key of this movement is going to be implementing different solutions in different ecosystems and different parts of the world and, and adapting each solution to each place and, and each individual effect. Um, so in terms of um, help, in terms of what we can do, what would you recommend is the number one thing um, individuals who are not involved in this field can do to help see the, the rainforest uh, to the best of their abilities? I think there, there, there are uh, uh, different things. Uh, First, it's a, it's a more uh, um, conscious uh, consumption. Uh, and this means, um, you know, and also from a government perspective and from the local governments in, in, in Europe and the United States is to rather than uh, block Brazil, uh, which simply would push Brazil to sell its produce to other countries which don't have environmental concerns, but actually say, we want to do business with Brazil. We want to invest in Brazil. We want to buy uh, even Brazilian meat However, we want to make sure that is, is being done sustainably, and we are actually giving money to farmers that not only follow the legislation, but are part of the solution, not only of, of the problem. So I think uh, it's very important to, uh, to, uh, um, to, to, to build constructive bridges and, and, and solutions rather than uh, clear-cut. Uh, uh, boycotts. Uh, then at, at, at a business, business level, uh, we have different initiatives going on. For instance, one of them, which is quite interesting, is called LEAF, uh, which is um, actually an, an alignment of um, Norway, Germany, United States, UK, and different large companies, including Amazon and, and many others, uh, which are basically uh, putting money on a fund, uh, which then being used to uh, pay back countries and regions on those countries uh, that have been able to reduce deforestation. So it basically gives some, some, some money back, some gives you know, a, a reason and it provides incentives for uh, uh, local farmers and local governments to actually uh, go towards that path uh, 
uh, with lower deforestation, lower emissions, and, and more conservation on, on the long run. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I, that just made me think of, um, I don't know if there's really any kind of tangible ways, but is there a way that we can specifically help you and your research or kind of um, in, in your type of job? Um, is there any way that kind of the other people can can support you in your work? Well, I think more than, 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 than me personally, I think it's very important to do what, what, have been, what you have been done is to actually bring scientists to the center of the debate. And and, uh, and and take science uh, uh, seriously, and 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 I think uh, when when you do that, actually you're able to see other layers of the issues, and not only uh, uh, um, scientists from uh, European and, and, and North American universities, which you know we do collaborate a lot, and my training has been in Europe, so I'm, I'm in that sense I'm partially uh, an European researcher, but also voices which are here in Brazil doing their jobs and, and, and engaging strongly in order to actually be able to have a, a, a broader perspective of what's going on um so just on this topic again of helping um one kind of um recurring method that's usually used is donating money to maybe a charity or an ngo as you said to these funds um however one of the key concerns is that sometimes these uh funds are misused or, or not used properly um so in in your experience what would be your advice in terms of what to look for in a charity and an ngo or how to ensure that our money is being used efficiently and effectively yeah, I mean, th this is something that people have to be very, very, very careful uh, uh, about. And uh, and I think uh, it's to look for institutions which are already well established, which are, um, are already uh, surrounded by a network of, of, of support and uh, and which which are transparent. You know, for instance, in our own research, uh, we have uh, we have been, uh, um, you know, uh, having the assistance of you know, Ford Foundation, uh, the government of Norway, Germany, UK, of course, Brazilian institutions uh, as well, and and it, everything is very is very transparent, is very straightforward, uh, because it's 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 a real crucial step in order to to to, to establish that. And but I, I can I can say from from our experience in working with, uh, including some large NGOs in Brazil, such as uh, ISA, IPAM, uh, WWF, uh, um, you know directly Greenpeace and others, they, they, they are very serious, um, which actually does not mean that not that everybody is serious. You, you might have, uh, you know, uh, adventures or, or people which are more, you know, that go here, go there, they have access to, to, to different uh, funders and which are not accountable and which are not part of a community. And, and then in those cases, you might have, of course, People which are outsiders and uh, and loan you know loan riders which are e excellent and are you know uh, creating new paths, but there is a high risk that they might be you know adventurers in this process and they might simply uh, disappear after they got the money and and of course that's that that's extremely uh, uh, problematic. So I think uh, um, you know to, to trust the net trust the network you know to trust the collectives. I think that might be uh, a good starting point rather than going after the loan riders. Yeah, definitely. And, and I think that this really shows us how we do need to make sure we document ourselves and speak to the scientists and speak to the leading experts before kind of just randomly putting some money into a fund and thinking that we're saving the world, um, which is often kind of the, the complex. Um, in your um, career and kind of in your extensive research, would you be able to give me um, kind of two examples? One example of the most promising kind of thing or evidence you've seen in terms of um, saving or, or mitigating the effect to the Amazon, and on the other hand, the most dreadful, kind of the most scary thing you, you've, ever, you've ever seen? Uh, I think, um, well, nowadays, it's, it's, I'm in, a, in, in an interesting position because I'm, um, I'm trying very hard uh, to save uh, not only the Brazilian Amazon, but to save Brazil's agribusiness. And, those, and the, the, both of them, they come together because uh, if we go further with deforestation, uh, we are already seeing major losses to agricultural production. And, and one of the things starting with what scares us most is the level of denialism, uh, of, of, of especially from farmers which are linked to populist, far, far right uh, uh, discourse and, and, and political wings. And, 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 and actually one thing which is very scary that you, you have some people that passes as scientists because they have, you know, done their PhDs, etc., but are not 
respect the members of the scientific community. And they are there actually selling uh, uh, this kind of, of, of denialist discourse, not only in relation to climate change, but also in relation to the effects of deforestation to agricultural production. And even uh, by saying that Brazil can do whatever it wants, can keep the forest in that people have, are going to buy Brazil nevertheless, because the world would starve without Brazil's food, which is not true. And, and so, I mean, I believe one of the, the key issues here uh, and the most scary thing is, is that level of denialism and how deep-rooted it is. And, and it's also deep-rooted because it's, you know, it's comfortable, right? It's comfortable to live in a world without climate change. It's comfortable to live in a world where, you have a, uh, where, where your markets are guaranteed. You don't have to fight for them. You don't have to be more uh, greener or more sustainable in order to keep your markets. And, and people sometimes they go into the, they prefer the easy answers rather than the, than the truth. And I think this is one of, one of the issues here. Uh, on the other hand, I think on the positive side, uh, one of the things we have been leading here with, with great success is uh, it's, it's an initiative called uh, Green Label, uh, which is uh, a, a agricultural uh, um, traceability tool, uh, which we are working with the, with the state government of Pará in Brazil, which is the state in Brazil with the highest deforestation rates, so the states with the highest problems, but they have uh, uh, allowed us to, to help them and work with them uh, on the development of a tool that allows full transparency on the supply chain. So if you are a supermarket in Europe buying meat uh, or soy from this particular state, you can actually know that that specific farmer you are buying meat from, whether he has deforested or not, whether he's illegal or not, whether he has slave labor and all of the, the key information that's necessary. And it's very hard for international buyers, especially, and also uh, big supermarkets acting in Brazil to get that information. And it's slowly that idea is spreading out. And now the other states in the Amazon are interested, other states in Brazil are interested. So, um, uh, you know, beyond, the, uh, you know, denialism, uh, uh, which is still very strong, uh, we are also finding some hope that we have been able to convince uh, governments to actually adopt better tools and science-based tools in order to uh, reduce deforestation and increase transparency. So um, I know that in a lot of cases, especially recently, um, as we're trying to decolonize our efforts to kind of um, do tourism and help um, countries in need, um, sometimes aid and funds can be misdirected and really um, sent to a country um, in ways that they don't need and that the local people actually do not need th this certain type of help. Um, do you think that's something that's recurrent in Brazil in terms of um, aid being misdirected and kind of being stereotypically distributed not to actually the, the, the true needs of the population? I, th I think it, it works at different levels. Uh, there has been, and uh, um, especially during the Workers' Party era, um, um, the creation of many uh, NGOs which have received a lot of public funds and, and that has been actually a systematic way to divert money, especially in, in areas such as education and, social, and, and, and healthcare, uh, because there is much less transparency sometimes, in specific in relationship to that. Uh, I, wouldn't, I haven't seen the same thing in relation to environmental NGOs. Um, of course, depending on, the, on, because there is this accusation, there has been this accusation from uh, the far right side of the government here uh, that, for instance, the money going to the Amazon fund uh, which is a fund supported ma mainly by Norway, uh, which one third of that money is going to NGOs. And that money has been misspent because uh, the money was spent with NGO staff rather than going to, to people. Uh, however, uh, when you look at the projects and the projects which has been supported, uh, the projects are basically providing a service. You know, it's basically uh, the Amazon funds paying the NGO to hire technicians to help farmers to map out their properties, to comply with the legislation, to improve uh, productivity, to do uh, uh, you know restoration, and this is something which is. Uh, intensive of, of human resources. So it's, it's natural that most of the money is going to be spent uh, with, with basically uh, human resources, which are complementing the work of the government, which doesn't have enough people to be there actually helping people uh, uh, towards a more sustainable uh, uh, production. So I think it's, it's important to separate things. Also, uh, because simply, you know, sharing money uh, down to farmers without care uh, might be, you know, uh, very dangerous. For instance, we have had reports that farmers which got, was, were getting money for buying fences, 
uh, they were buying fences for, but not for restoration. They were buying fences to put more cattle in their lands. Uh, or sometimes that, uh, for instance, you create a payment for ecosystem services program. And there is a tendency that if you don't take enough care of how that money is spent, that farmers that already do not want to deforest because for instance, their farms are very far away, that even sometimes their farms, there, is, there, is, there isn't even a road that leads to their farms. And they would be the ones to first ask for money, money that are not going to make any difference at all, except making those farmers richer. Uh, and, and so if you don't really take very much care about how you spend that money, how well directed it is, uh, it can be indeed problematic. We actually have published an article uh, um, called uh, Amazon Fund 10 Years uh, you, that you can find on, on, on Google, which we have uh, critically analyzed how the more than one billion US dollars put into the Amazon fund has been spent with also strong suggestions on how it should be improved and how should it be spent more strategically. And this is actually the main issue that the, the area that needs most money doesn't receive the money. That tends to be the main issue here, not that the money that is got is actually misspent. This tends to be a smaller issue in the, in the bigger picture. Do you not feel that international organizations such as the IMF should have a more sustainable attitude? And if yes, what sustainable development pol uh, policies would be more effective in your opinion? Well, uh, I agree with you. International multilateral organizations should be doing a much better job. And I think, uh, I mean, all of them have already declared and, and they already put forward plans to, to invest from fossil fuels and to um, uh, avoid supporting, you know, uh, uh, areas and businesses which are linked to deforestation, but the, it's always very much in the future. I think that's the main concern. You know, oh, from from in 2030, things are going to be much better, and we don't have 2030, right? We don't have that much time. So I think uh, what is really crucial here is for them to anticipate. Also, one other thing which I think it's it's very important from um, not not only international uh, um, so organizations, but also financial organizations and countries is the issue around transparency. Uh, we have uh, uh, we have done a research uh, that you can find by you know by googling uh, um, illegal gold and, and my surname uh, and actually we have found that something like a third of Brazil's gold production has is has some level of illegality and which means that the gold that's being produced and actually all of that has been exported mostly to to Europe to places like Switzerland uh, places and then also to Italy also Italy buys a lot. Of, of gold from Brazil uh, are very much linked to gold produced illegally, gold that is linked to uh, to, to illegal uh, um, uh, you know um, miners invading uh, indigenous lands, putting mercury in the water, you know this and this is making the indigenous population ill. There is one one uh, sp specific indigenous land called Munduruku, uh, which is very which is being invaded right now by, by by gold miners, and and they have done a study, and 100% of the samples of the blood samples of the indigenous population that area had mercury poisoning, uh, and and then when you go to those countries such as Switzerland, such as Italy, and try to find out from where they are buying that gold and, and to see if that gold is being bought by companies which are directly linked to illegal mining, you cannot find that information because then you have the whole, you know, banking secrets, so on and so forth. And so I think, you know, from uh, not only multilateral companies should do a much better job in terms of uh, anticipating their targets, but we need more transparency from countries and from in specifically in relation from where they are buying uh, not only agricultural products, but also gold, uh, in order to, to, to basically uh, uh, to stop a situation whereby if you go to a fancy jewelry in Geneva and buy a, a ring, maybe you are even directly supporting the poison of indigenous population in the Amazon. And it, unless you have that information, unless you have that transparency, we cannot, we are not going to be able to get rid of those situations.